Today's guest on the podcast is the Tony Hawk. Tony was nine years old when his older brother gave him a blue fiberglass skateboard, which was chipped and scratched from years of use. And the first time Tony stepped on it, there was no fireworks or big epiphany or revelation. And there was no foreshadowing that he would go on to become the most famous skateboarder of all time. Just when he reached the end of the driveway, he looked back at his brother and asked, how do I turn? (laughs) So Tony figured out how to turn around on the skateboard and do much more. At age 14, he turned pro. And by the age of 16, he was regarded as the best competitive skateboarder in the world. By the time he was 25, he'd competed in over 100 professional contests, winning 73 of them. And he was crowned the vertical skate champion for 12 years in a row, also known as vert skating, I learned. Um, Tony is not only the world's greatest skateboarder, but he's an entrepreneur, a dad, and an overall really nice guy. I am completely honored that he said yes to this podcast and took the time to educate this audience on skateboarding. A lot of us don't have any background with it, and I know I didn't. Um, So I learned a lot about skateboarding, but I also had some really great epiphanies regarding mental toughness and pushing boundaries and, you know, just a great conversation with Tony. So I hope you all enjoy this episode with the Tony Hawk. Welcome to the same 24 hours podcast with Meredith Atwood. We all have the same 24 hours each day, and it's what we do with those hours that makes all the difference between our health, happiness, and success. Welcome to another episode of the Same 24 Hours Podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Atwood. I'm very excited about today's guest, Tony Hawk. Hi, Tony. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. I am so thrilled you're here. So, little disclosure, I know nothing about skateboarding, (laughs) but I have always known who you are and have been a fan from afar. So, I really thank you for your time and your energy today. So, Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. So at this stage in your life, how do you decide when to say yes and when to say no? Oh, wow. I, uh, that's, I, that's the struggle every day, to be honest. Um, well, I, what to say no to, the things that I feel are important, what the things that I feel are uh, to, to say yes to are the things I feel are important, the things I feel like will resonate, um, that will uh, not necessarily be the most successful financially, but the ones that I feel that will promote, say, skateboarding in a positive light in, in, a, in a bigger way to a bigger audience, um, and things that I can include my family in. I mean, th- those, are the, the, those are the baseline for something that I would say yes to or that I would spend my time doing. Uh, if I can enjoy it with my family and if I feel like it will have an impact. And um, it's tricky, though, because I, I get a lot of offers – uh, some seem fantastical, <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, how could you pass that up? And it's like, well, I, I, I have stolen so much of my time from my family already as they grow up, uh, especially with my kids, that I, I feel like I would much rather be present to them than go to, say, the big Hollywood premiere. Yeah, I bet that is a hard choice. Well, it's probably not as hard anymore, though, is it? It's not as hard, no. And, and, you know, it all seems it all seems probably trite and trivial that like, oh, when you get to, you know, you, you get these f- fabulous options and it's like, but but at some point you lose yourself in all that and it's just more distracting than anything. Yeah. So let's talk about parenting for a little bit. Um, so your oldest son, is he he's a pro skater, right? He is. Yes. So how did that sort of happen? Did, was it organic? Did he just see you doing it and kind of toddled along behind? Did you ever have to push him? Like, what was that relationship like? Uh, well, in the beginning, it was more by uh, necessity because I wasn't making very much money. Um, his mom was working full time. And if I was going to go somewhere, I just had to take him. So he was surrounded <laughs> by skating growing up. This is true. I mean, like I took him to... Japan because I got an offer to do some exhibitions there when he was three years old um, and I and I had to make a deal with him you know when I'm skating you have to be quiet for that hour and, and play with your toys and then I'm yours the rest of the day um, 
but you it was like, hard. You have to skate or you're going to get left behind, kid. Well, it wasn't that. It was it was more that he was so surrounded by it right. that he just picked up on it. So well, I wasn't forcing him to skate. Sure. He just he just chose to do it because it was it was all around, and he had a you know really good support system, obviously. But um, as he got older, he got a little more jaded. And I think more frustrated with it because he realized that everyone's watching him and he had this bloodline and he had this expectation from others, not from me. And he got really sort of disenchanted with it and started doing other things. Uh, around the time he was 12, 13, he, he started riding motocross more. He started riding bikes. He started surfing. And that was all fine, but, but he he was really ignoring his skating. And at some point he started telling me about how he wanted to um, get endorsements and sponsorships with these other activities he was doing. And that, while I was supportive in that, I tried to tell him, I said, Riley, you're, that's great, but, but you're really far advanced in skating for your age. I mean, he really was. He mm -hmm. was, it was so exceptional for his age. And he was, he was good at these other sports, but he wasn't at the level where he's going to get endorsements. And so I said, you know, if you really want to make a career out of one of these things, it's probably going to be skating. And you don't have to, you don't have to live in my shadow. You don't have to, you know, skate for the same companies. Um, but I think that that is your ticket to success if you want to do something in the sort of action sports field. And he, he took that to heart. He started, he started getting a little more serious about it started actively pursuing his own sponsors. And then a couple of years later, he had made a name for himself and had a whole different set of endorsements than I did, um, including quitting my skate company to ride for, <laughs> to ride for one of the more prominent um, street skate companies, right. uh, Baker, who, who, who were pursuing him. It wasn't that he asked to, to be connected with them. They actually came to him. So, he paved his own way. Um, it was uh, it, it was a really, I think, a, a challenge for him to break out of the shadow, obviously, of, of mine. But people came to recognize him for his skills and for his style and for his creativity more than for his father. That's really awesome. I, I think it's interesting, though, because I have a, a daughter. She's nine, and she's sort of starting to do CrossFit and weightlifting. And I was a weightlifter. And so I've noticed even at age nine, when I can give her advice, you know, help her just a little bit, even with, you know, technique or whatever, I'm sort of getting the, oh my God, mom, <laughs> stop, you know? So I, I just, I think it's really interesting that, and, and great that your son kind of took your advice to heart versus the eye roll. I don't know how to overcome that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard. Well, but with my other kids, they're not trying to make a career out of it. They enjoy skating, but it's the same. If I give them any advice, they do not follow it. <laughs> um, and I'm talking about just in terms of technique and, and tricks and things like that. And at some point, I've actually sort of it's come to a head a couple times where it's like, you guys, I might know what I'm talking about <laughs> to do just these tricks. Bit. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. And, and, but, but without fail, someone else gives them the same advice and they do it. That's so funny. You are not immune, Tony. <laughs> No, 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 not at all. And I accept that, but I, but I do find it, <laughs> I do find it morbidly funny. So, what has changed since becoming a parent? I know for me, the answer is everything. I mean, everything under the sun changes. It's not glamorous. It's not glorious. Um, but you learn a lot, and you definitely figure out how to put the right things in perspective. So, what really changed for you with parenting? Uh, well, the idea that it's not just about you, obviously, and that um, what you're doing is is setting up a, a legacy and a support system for a new generation. Um, and I think the thing that really changed with me was my discipline in terms of my schedule and prioritizing my time so that it it their it, being available to them is the first priority. <clears throat> Um, and that was a big challenge, especially through the success of, of my skate career. And when they were very young, there were all kinds of opportunities to travel and to do things like that. And, and a lot of times I was probably a little bit too excessive with, with chasing those opportunities and not being available to my kids. So I think in the last probably six or seven years, I've learned 
that to say no. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that it's much more important to just be there for them, even in the quiet times, uh, especially in the difficult times or in the sad times and in, in the times when they're, they're doing something that needs support. Let's say they're playing a school of, you know, playing at a school concert event or they're, they're at a sports game or they're at a rehearsal. Um, that's far more important than whatever else has been offered to me. Yeah. Yeah. So like any good student of skating, I watched the Bones Brigade documentary last night. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, my husband said that, I had to watch good, Gleaming the Cube. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's a good history, but it's entertaining. He said, ask Tony about Gleaming the Cube. I was like, gleaming or gleaning? What is the word? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make sense either way. That's funny. Um, but one of the things in the documentary that your teammate um, at the time Rodney Mullen said really struck me and it felt applicable to my life. And I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on it. And he said, um, at some point there's no gratification in winning because you are just upholding something. So you don't lose it that you can't live in the house you built because you're too busy guarding it. And I know there was a time where you thought, you know, I just don't want to compete anymore. This isn't fun. Even though you were always number one. So you were always winning. Like what did that period feel like? And how did you, get through it to go on to be a champion for years and years and years and you still be on top as you are now? Uh, well, originally it felt very isolating and it felt like I was set apart from my peers, which I didn't like at all because I, I found skateboarding because I finally found a community that I belong to, mm. um, you know, a, a sense of values and sensibilities that I couldn't find in, in traditional team sports. And then suddenly I was cast out. I don't want to say upward. I was just cast aside that it was like, oh, Tony, he just always wins. So, you know, don't even try. It, you know, you're, you're only trying for second. And then if I didn't win, the world was ending. And it was like, oh, he lost. He's he's losing it. You know what I mean? It wasn't like yeah. you 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 did well and you got second or third place. It was like, it's over. And this is like and, age 15, right? I mean... Uh, more... The, when it really hit hard was more around 17, 18. Because you were professional was, by 14. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, but, but as, as fabulous as that sounds, it really <laughs> just meant I was, was competing in a different class. Okay. Uh, and, and for very little money. So it wasn't like it was some great big contract and champagne right. ceremony. It was just like, all right, you're, you've won the amateur events. Now you're going pro. Okay. Um, but, as as the stakes got higher, especially you know in my in my later teen years, that's when it hit really hard, and when I wanted to pull back from it. In my teen years, when it started really, in my later teen years, is when it started feeling I felt started feeling the pressure, and I wanted to move away from it. And so, I did move away from it. But at the time, at that time in skating, it was almost impossible to make a career out of it if you weren't competing. Uh, you, you know, YouTube didn't exist. People weren't sponsoring you because you were doing big tricks and things. People were only sponsoring you and paying you and buying your skateboards if you were at the skate competitions. Uh, so there was a great concern from my sponsor that I wanted to pull back. And I think what I did was I, I sort of refocused my skating to uh, tricks that I enjoyed more but maybe weren't the most outlandish or the most um technical and that helped sort of that helped sort of uh i'm not sure how to explain it that that made my style more well-rounded mm -hmm. that that helped to sort of complete uh, all the issues of, of people that that they had complaints about me where they, they said oh he's just tricks he's just a robot he has no style and then i sort of worked on my style it wasn't it, the the goal wasn't for competition purposes. It was just so that I felt more complete in how I skated. Um, and then when I went back to competing, my attitude was much more irreverent. It was it was that I'm going to try everything and do like my absolute best or fail miserably. And so I wasn't in this calculated uh, point system where I'm trying to be strategic with my moves and, and move up the rankings. It was more like it's all or nothing. And, and it was very freeing at that yeah. point. And when I did do well, I did exceptionally well. 
um, you know, it was it was almost like there was no doubt that that I had won those events. When I didn't do well, then I didn't, and that was fine. And and I felt like I had come far enough that I was allowed those failures. Uh, and that that was probably the the most liberating part of of competing in those days. So there's so much focus like on the psychology of sport and mental toughness now. I mean, you, there's tons of books and podcasts on how to do that. I mean, you had that years and years ago. I mean, was was it something that you cultivated? Like, were you a tough little kid or did it kind of grow after this time period when you said, hey, I'm just going to give it my all? I, I think it really came. I think my attitude came from the sort of ridicule and, and what we now call bullying that I received when I was a kid. Yeah. I, I was very skinny, very small for my age. People always thought I was at least two or three years younger. Sometimes they thought I was a girl oh. and all of those things were, uh, were very, they were crushing at the time, but also formative because, I learned to navigate that and, and to sort of believe in what I was doing. And then when I started skating, then I was marked as a total outcast because skaters were the furthest thing from cool that you could imagine when I was in in elementary school and middle school. I used to have to hide my skateboard. Just really? stuck it was like a trombone of our day. <laughs> it was worse. I mean, there was like, it was like jocks, you know, music, nerds, and then skaters oh. in the totem pole of cool so, uh, so I learned to sort of navigate that. And then when I got into skating, my style of skating was very, I don't want to say it was, it was considered avant-garde or, or almost like circus tricks. Yeah. So, so I was ridiculed. So, so I found, it's like, I, I found my tribe in skateboarding and then I was, I, and I was already marked an outcast for that. And then I was an outcast within that outcast activity because of my style. So I, I was very um, in You're tune like, I can't with win, man. <laughs> I can't win. But at the same time, I did find enough support. I found a few friends that, that were interested in that type of skating and, and we connected and that was our support system. So I found a few friends that were like my age and they were skating and they were into learning the new tricks as well. And it was like, we, that's all I needed. I yeah. just needed that little bit of support to believe in what I was doing. Yeah. I mentioned last night to my husband after I watched that documentary that you were, you know, quote unquote, disliked by some of your contemporaries during, during the early days. And I thought he was going to like pick up a sword and fight for you, Tony. <laughs> he was like, I was like, no, no, it was in the documentary. And he was literally shocked. And, and he was like, that makes me so sad, Mayor. You've got to just please tell him that Tony was so important to me and my friends. And I was like, okay, man, I'll tell him. <laughs> so there you go. There's the message that I had. Oh, uh, well, thank on. you. <laughs> no, but you know what it was? I think it was, it was once I, once I started believing in, in what I was doing, that, that it, it did have some value. Um, that's when my skating really took off in terms of, creativity and progression and and finding my my strength it, it, you know my uh, like i said i was i was a late bloomer so it wasn't until i was 17 or 18 where i really started getting tall and getting strength and then suddenly i was doing these tricks way above everyone's heads and that's kind of when i shut down the haters yeah yeah it, um, christian is it hasoy he, he said yeah. in that documentary that you drove him crazy because while he quote unquote had the style you you had you know all the i guess tricks but he had to keep going higher and higher in like literally vertically because you just would come out with three new tricks out of nowhere <laughs> yeah and and that I, I think that's what gave me the confidence to yeah. to keep going and, and to to not listen to all that noise and and to be honest it was it was a very much a blessing because as as things progressed later and and obviously things got way bigger than I ever imagined with our video games and with with licensing and things like that. Then I, I experienced a second wave of so-called haters with all that mainstream success because it was like, oh, Tony Hawk's he's a sellout. He's you know, he's fabricated. This is all by design. And it was like, well, no, I've been doing this much longer than you imagined. <laughs> and and I didn't. You know, and and had I had these 
these opportunities when I was younger, I would have taken them. It wasn't like suddenly I was shifting my values to be sponsored by big companies. If McDonald's had offered me a sponsorship at age 15, I would have taken it in a heartbeat. Right. But those offers were not coming in. Um, and so, so then I sort of survived that wave of haters and, and, you know, and, and, and stood my ground and kept skating and, and eventually got recognized as just for my, for my, um, actual skills. And then the third wave of that was social media. So I was so, I was so ready for all of this based on what I considered the, you know, we just called it, we, we call it getting picked on as a kid. Right. But it's now now we know it's bullying um but that did prepare me for all these other elements and um and the same with social media it's just like there's just so much noise people used to say these terrible things to my face right <laughs> so know? which one is you, worse like that that's yeah. the question i had is is it better to have it you know in your face or some coward behind the computer <laughs> um well it's Neither. it's a lot more um it's a lot more devastating when you hear it face to face, but at the same time you can, you can stand up for yourself right there and then in the moment. So what do you do? Do you like, what is your social media like uh, method of handling? Do you ignore? Do you delete? You know, I have some people that, you know, want to, Oh, I I don't, I don't engage in the, in the ridiculous back and forth because you're never going to win. And all you're doing is, is giving them the attention they're craving. Right. Right. So very much it's ignored. I, the only time I ever intervene is if something comes up with my family mm-hmm. or if, if someone targets my kids or my wife, then either I'm going to delete it or, or if it's, you know, if it's vile or if it's violent, then I would report it. But that's rare. That's yeah. very rare. Well, let's talk a little bit about pushing boundaries. I mean, skating in general from a sport and a starting point is pushing boundaries, but what, what did pushing boundaries mean to you then? And wh- how has that kind of evolved to what, what does it mean to you now? Well, pushing boundaries when I was younger, just meant breaking new ground of, of doing new tricks. And, um, that entailed figuring out new ways to, uh, to maneuver the skateboard or to maneuver my body or combining existing tricks and at some point, it was it was very much th- that I could uh, be learning tricks nonstop because I was just combining existing tricks together, and um, and sort of making it all up and and making up names as I went along. And um, the whole skateboarding was just an empty canvas when I got into it, and it was the wild west in terms of who invents what, who gets credit for it, and uh, I was borrowing techniques and and i was um i was definitely connecting with guys like rodney mullen to figure out what his his tricks are that he's doing on the ground and how we could do that in the air and and he was taking some of my tricks and doing them on the ground and uh it was it was a blast it was just this really creative process nowadays pushing boundaries to me means more breaking the um breaking the stigmas that are associated with skating and, and pushing boundaries in terms of literal boundaries and borders and bringing awareness to skating in, in very unlikely places. And by that, I mean, uh, the Olympics are coming. I think skateboarding is going to be shown to a whole new audience, a, a very international audience. There are growing skate scenes in places like Cambodia, South Africa, Ethiopia, um, and I, it, with that, it's very exciting to me because that is breaking boundaries in a whole new way. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk a little bit about your foundation because that that's kind of an extension. Yeah. So my foundation, uh, was, was, um, it, we support public skate parks in low income areas. That's, that's the baseline of what we do. Uh, and that all started about how long has it been? 16 years, 16 years ago. I saw skateboarding getting popular and I saw a, a serious lack of facilities in terms of the support and, and the cities not recognizing skateboarding as a legitimate activity that the kids are doing or just telling them not to skate in public areas. So basically they were these kids finally find something they connect to and then the authorities are telling them they can't do it, even though 
they're not trying to <laughs> they're not trying to be vandals they're just trying to to better themselves and i also saw some affluent areas building skate parks that were terrible <laughs> because they were they were going with the lowest bidding contractor which is usually just someone that poured sidewalks and claiming they knew what a skate park was when they clearly didn't and i saw these parks getting built for hundreds of thousands of dollars that were that were much less fun than the local mall parking lot right and so i felt like i i could i could affect change in terms of directing that funding to the more needy areas but also connecting the the city's councils with the kids they're providing these facilities for and change that bridge or you know or to bridge that gap of the of the design process um and i didn't really know how we would do that but uh, i knew that at the very least i had a voice that could that people might listen to um and to date uh it's been great we have a couple of big partnerships one is the uh ralph c wilson jr foundation in michigan and we uh have funded over 600 skate parks now wow um, Wow. across the u.s and and some we also have an extension with skatistan so our international outreach is through their projects in cambodia and south africa um and soon jordan we're going to actually help them build a facility there very cool very cool so you know you're very big into philanthropy and just being in the public spotlight i mean you do a lot of good and i think it's really interesting that you hear about people in the public eye and and celebrities, you know, they do really good things. And then you hear people complain, you know, oh, my gosh, the gift tax, or you gave me a house, but now I have to pay real estate tax on it. How do you handle being generous and, and, and helping people and then that kind of, you know, negativity? I, I always find that so fascinating. Um, you know, when well, it, there, uh, people will always be cynical, doesn't matter what you do. And, and, and especially with what we do, I guess the, the the silver lining of what we do is that we literally have concrete proof of our work. Yeah, it's not it's not some sort of um, ethereal research that we're doing. We're we're providing these facilities. You can go and see them in in action. Um, but at the same time, it's always like, well, why don't you build one in this town? We don't have a skate park, and 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 <laughs> our model is that which we are trying to empower the communities that are already trying to help themselves. So. I think what we've learned is is our resources are just as effective as our grants. Got so it. we provide you step by step on how to get a skate park built in your area, petitioning the city, holding fundraisers, design, um, involving the community, finding location. All of those things are, are just as important as providing the finances for it. Um, and so I think that that's that's the thing that it's hard for the outsider to understand you know someone in a very small town in maybe or in an inner city and they say why don't you give us a skate park it's like well why don't you try to get one going on your own and we'll give you the the, the resources to help you right right so let's switch gears to the video games so obviously you're a big deal in the video game world how do you handle that with your kids now because all my kids want to do is play fortnite <laughs> yeah <laughs> like do you um, feel like do you have any ish, like hard tug of like your parent side and your video game like how does that work uh well it's pretty cut and dry it's just you got you need to make time to get your homework done you know and <laughs> and i of course I, i'm probably much more liberal in terms of of my approach to video gaming and and the effects and and the the positive aspects of it so i do allow them for the most part to to do it especially when we're traveling please just do yes, that and absolutely. don't bother me um but <laughs> Um, Imagine if you'd had that 25 years ago, right? Oh, there's so many times when I'm on planes <laughs> and I'm thinking, I can't believe we used to just do this with, and, or just be subjected to whatever they're going to show us on the screens. Right. Or here's a book. Like, can you imagine telling a, a or, kid to read a book now? Yeah. Jeez. Or play the license plate game. <laughs> um, yeah. Read a book. But I mean, it, it's great. It's, it's beautiful that I, I love, I embrace it. I embrace the technology. Um, but definitely there, there, ha there should be a limit, I, I think, in terms of just being productive, you know, or, or being um, social. Right. And, and I think that that's probably where I – I don't intervene, but I just – I plan things. I, I, I try to get them out and doing other things other than skating – I mean other than uh, 
playing video games, I try to get them out skating. <laughs> right. And, and so that's probably my role in that is just sort of, I don't want to say distracting them, but giving them other options and, and sort of making plans. I think that's in, in some ways, probably the, the thing they might love about me and complain about me at the same time is that I'm always making plans for them. <laughs> how did you get into to video? Like, how did the video game process start? Did it started, uh, well, it, 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 I always loved video games as a kid. I mean, st stating, starting with, with in television and Pong and everything else, and then going into Pac-Man and then Missile Command, and, and, and I was, you know, the, the skate park had an arcade, so I was always into the video games. Whenever skateboarding was included in a video game, I was <laughs> right there. Like, I, I, I had to buy... A Commodore 64 so I could play Skate or oh Die. Oh gosh, a Commodore 64. Yeah. I wow. only bought it for the game Skate or Die. Um, and then playing 720 at the arcade as a kid. And so I knew there was a serious void in, in skateboarding and video games. And it was to be expected. Skateboarding was not that popular, especially in the mid-90s. But I got approached by a developer that wanted to do a PC game with skateboarding and he had a very crude engine and he, he asked if I wanted to, to pitch it with him to big develop to big publishers. And, uh, I didn't have any other options <laughs> and, you know, it sounded like, it sounded like a fun project. His, his engine was not great, but there was something there, you know, it was pretty fun. And he and I went to a bunch of different publishers and console manufacturers, including Nintendo and um, uh, Midway and other and other ones. And we were just we just were met with so much um, pushback that it it was it was really frustrating. They they basically said, "Look, skateboarding is unpopular. Why would a skateboarding video game be popular? Um, you know, just home video games are not huge at the moment anyway." So. It was all very, it was all very discouraging, and and he basically gave up. Hmm. But because I had gone to all these meetings with him, the seed was planted in the video game world that I wanted to be involved in the game, which was probably the best part about all that about all those failed meetings. Right. And um, not long after, I got a call from uh, from Take Two, which is the company Rockstar Games now, which does uh, Grand Theft Auto. And I got a call from Activision almost at the exact same time. And they both said, hey, we want to do a video game. And I, I checked out both of what they were doing. And when I went to Activision, it was clear that, that their game was much more intuitive and much more user-friendly for someone that doesn't skate. And um, I basically signed on immediately when I saw what they had developed already. Uh, and they told me, they said, well, look, we're doing a game with or without you, but we'd love to have your help on it. And, uh, and what they had created at that moment was based on a game. The engine they used was based on a game that they had made called apocalypse with Bruce Willis. Mm -hmm. Bruce Willis was actually a featured character, which didn't do very well, which was actually was a total failure for them. But the engine lent itself perfectly to skating and the motion of skating and so the first game I ever played was Bruce Willis on a skateboard <laughs> with a gun strapped to his back um, doing kickflips in the desert. Oh, that's funny. And I knew right then that, that this was it. This was the, this was the right, the right um, design, the right timing, the right team, and, uh, and off we went. Was this Bruce Willis with hair or without hair? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember, actually. I feel that's like he never important. has hair. I know. Yeah. I feel like that too. When I see him with hair, I'm like, "What, what are you doing with that hair?" Doesn't but there, there is actually in our. I think it's in our second game, first or second game, in the mall level. If you if you break through into the um, into the sort of attic of the mall, there are all these uh, uh, stacks of apocalypse games with cobwebs on them. <laughs> oh, that's funny. It's a little Easter egg in one of our games. Oh, that's awesome. So, how many games are there? And then are, you've got one coming out, right? Yeah, uh, I, I honestly, with all the different versions and different mobile games and things like that, it, it, it's hard to keep track of how many games were released. But wow. uh, general, like the the main titles, we had about twelve that were wow. the, that were the ones people would really know. Um, 
and I no longer work with Activision, so there's no more Tony Hawk's Pro Skater that will be happening. But I am working with a developer on a mobile game, uh, mobile uh, Maple Media, and we are going to release um, Tony Hawk's Skate Jam for phones from mobile uh, this year, actually. That's awesome. And I'm very excited about it because I've been working on the control scheme and the levels with them very closely, and, and I feel like uh, we're on the right track with, with how people would see, without, without saying this is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, we're on the right track to people recognizing some similarities. Yeah, and it's something for kids to do on planes. <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> which is exactly what I, I, I flew home from New York yesterday, and um, we actually got separated uh, with my kids. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in, in the interest of chivalry, my, my wife and my daughter were in first class and I was in coach. But um, <laughs> I, uh, man. I was playing that game the whole time, trying that's to dial funny. it in. So that's what I'm doing on planes, too. I bet there's someone's got video of you on social media playing that video game. And they have posted <laughs> it. And you just got a hashtag. Maybe. <laughs> So, um, for, like, for someone like me who doesn't know a ton about skating and for the message you're trying to convey, what does skating teach? Like, what are the lessons, like, when, you, when you're encouraging kids to do this? What, what, is, what does skating teach? Well, Besides I think being it, fun. I mean, I, I think it fun. teaches you a sense of, of self-discipline and, um, and confidence, maybe, that you don't find elsewhere because... Skating is totally on your own terms and in your own voice, and it teaches you the value of perseverance and determination, I think, more than almost anything, because you can try something over and over and over and over until you finally get it right or you finally make it once. And that feeling of accomplishment, you only have yourself to credit for that. Um, And and it's, it's empowering. Um, And also there is a community, you know, it's more like an artistic community where everyone appreciates that you're involved but they all also respect that everyone does it differently and, and everyone comes from different walks of life. I don't know. I think, I feel like it's a great equalizer. Very cool. So much of my audience, um, is endurance athletes or ultra endurance athletes. So I'm constantly asking the question, you know, when is it enough? When is one Ironman enough? When is one hundred mile run enough? And kind of skating seems to have, from what I've looked at, seems to take this, similar path like with the introduction of the mega ramp and social media sharing tricks and and all the videos i mean do you ever struggle with with the question of like okay is this enough or is this always where you envision it is is this the pushing boundaries that you you like so much uh i i love that skating continues to evolve it's what i loved about it originally is that it doesn't matter how good you are at skating there will always be something new to learn And people keep pushing the limits of what's possible. So that's what drew me in at first to skating. These days, I'm 50, so I'm not trying to break new ground in terms of tricks, spinning, height, stuff like that. But I have found a way to focus my style more on the technical uh, lower impact tricks and still be progressive. So even at my age, I can still be learning new techniques and the that's that's the beauty of skating is that the, in, in a lot of ways, of course, I know I won't be able to do that in, into my <laughs> later, later years. But in a lot of ways, there, there is this timeless factor and there's this constant progression. And, and the, the the boundaries that are being or the, 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 the milestones that are being made today are the things that kids are starting with as they learn growing up. So, for instance, when I. I was a, a, a McTwist, a 540, wasn't invented until I was 16 years old, right? Mm-hmm. Kids are learning McTwist before they're even 10 years old because they know it's possible. Right. And then pushing that even further. So, so the foundation for what is considered not basic but, but uh, a good skating is already met before they're even in their teens. And that, that is what keeps the progression going. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely something intrinsically young about skating. I mean, you mentioned you're in your 50s, but how do you feel about aging? Is being 50 more concerning to people around you (laughs) than it is to you? Um, In some ways, yes. But but like I said, I've learned to I've learned to uh, 
tweak my style so that I'm not risking my life all the time and and doing things that I enjoy and, and still being creative. I mean, if you look at, say, some of my most recent videos, I'm still doing new tricks. I'm just not doing them 10 feet out of the ramp or doing right. them on the mega ramps and things like that um, because I'm, I'm very aware of my mortality and, and I want to be around for my kids. So um, so it's been great. And because skating is such an art form, you, you can do that. You can change your art style. Uh, but if you want to be competing at the top level, yeah, you got to take those risks, you know, and, and that's more of a young man's game. I'm talking about, you know, in, in, in your twenties, maybe even earlier, that's what we're going to see in the Olympics. Right. Right. So speaking of risking life, what about injury? What was the worst injury that you've experienced in your career? Oh, I broke my pelvis in uh, 2003 and that was by far the most devastating injury that I had to overcome. How did that sort of change your your thoughts on on fear and risk, or or did it? Uh, that's a good question. I it changed. Well, it definitely gave me a. It gave me pause in terms of my my goals and my priorities, and especially with my kids, because it was like you can't just be out here throwing caution to the wind all the time. Um, but it also gave me a sense of how much I truly love skating because to overcome that injury and to regain my self-confidence, it took about a year to, to really get back to where I was comfortable doing these sort of tricks again. And I obviously was not doing it because of money or fame or anything. I was just doing it because I loved it. And, and it, I guess it, 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 it had that resolve with, with how much passion I have for skating in order to, relearn how to how to skate you know with with this to overcome this injury um but definitely it gave me a sense that i gotta (laughs) i gotta rethink my my style of skating and um my priorities yeah um so you've been quoted as and i don't know if this is true or false this is the google talking but it's that you that landing the 900 was the best day of your life but knowing what I know about you now from following you, I, I don't know if that's true or not. I, I tend to think it's not. Uh, well, that's what I was, qu- you know, in that, in, in the hype of that moment, that's what I said. And, and, um, it probably felt like that just because I had been trying it for almost 10 years of my life prior so to what that is moment. The 900? Let's explain. To uh, it, it's like basically a, a two and a half somersault in the air going up one side of the ramp, spinning around two and a half times, and then coming back down the same side of the ramp. Totally. Um, easy. 900 refers to the degrees of rotation and it was something that i i learned 720s um in 1985 and i had tried 900s a few years later so i had been trying 900s for about 10 years of my life so when i when i was quoted and saying that was the best of my life it felt like that because it was something that i had been trying for so long and obviously there are things that are much more important to me in my life in terms of my children my family um but I wasn't trying to have a baby for 10 years of my life. So. <laughs> no, that's so interesting, though. 10 years. And gosh, I interviewed um, James Lawrence, who, who's known as the Iron Cowboy. He did 50 Ironmans in 50 states in 50 days. And he mentioned how it took him 10 years to get to that you know, event. And no one really notices or knows how hard it was for that one moment. And it sounds like. It sounds like 10 years is a pretty common theme. To, and that's kind of morbid when you think about yeah. it. That's a lot of well, effort. And, and I, you know, I, I obviously that that's not <laughs> in the heat of the moment. I, I might have exaggerated, but uh, but definitely it felt it felt to me like a culmination of, of all my competing years. And also right. I was already considering dropping out of competition after that year because I had been doing it for 20 years of my life. And so that was, that was a good out. Yeah. I was ending on a high note. So I felt very much like, oh, I'm, I can finally feel good about leaving competition behind. Yeah. So are your fondest memories of success, you know, like the 900 or are they smaller moments, like part of the journey when you, like, when you think back on your life, are you going to remember more of those <laughs> success moments like the 900 or is it this, the smaller, like leaner times? Oh, I think I think it'll be probably the leaner times. I mean, the 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 the, 
the challenge of, of trying to be a pro skater, especially in the early 90s and raising a young family, it, it seemed incredibly difficult. But but those are the times that I remember the, so fondly because we were just trying anything. We're, you know, there were six dudes driving in a van doing demos in parking lots um, and all sharing one hotel room. And, and as much as ridiculous as that sounds, that was we were living the dream and we were we were making it work. And and I loved that we survived all that. So I look back on those moments fondly. The moments that I think are the big ones for me aren't necessarily the ones that took place in front of lots of people. Uh, maybe it's certain tricks that I accomplished, like for videos, the, that I knew I always wanted to do and that I that I had the resolve to just go and make it happen. Those are the times when I feel most accomplished. I bet the, that was one stinky hotel room. Six, yeah, six boys. pretty gross. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff on the internet, like letters to your 20 year old self. Um, what would you tell your 20 year old self? If you could go back? Uh, just stay the course. Um, you will not believe the ride you're in for. <laughs> and um, if I had any advice, I would say, don't try to do a loop ramp for a TV show <laughs> in a monkey suit. <laughs> Is that would that be the you one. Got hurt? That's when I got hurt. Yeah. And um, oh, you were in a monkey suit. Yeah, yeah. Which, unfortunately, oh. that that wasn't what caused it, but it didn't help the whole scenario. Well, it probably threw you off balance, right? I mean, was it no, no, no. Suit? It was it was more because the ramp we were skating, um, what, you know, the loop, the the full loop ramp, the one I'm talking about is like a Hot Wheels ramp, oh. and it was something that we, I have one that we were on tour with. And we were doing it every night for this show, uh, for the Boom Boom Huck Jam. And then when we got offered to do, we were doing the the uh, Jackass spinoff called Wild Boys. They wanted us to. They had a they had a um, a chimpanzee that was skating with us. Oh my goodness! So we were dressed up as monkeys skating with the chimpanzee, and then the ramp we were skating. This guy actually has a loop connected to it, but his was all weathered and worn and slow. And I was using the same timing as my ramp that was very much a, a fast ramp. And so my timing was so off that I ended up coming off the wall and just falling to the ground. Um, and that's why I fell, because it was, it was because his ramp was just too slow. I think it might have been, been the monkey. I, I, like the <laughs> real monkey. I, I don't know. What was that like? <laughs> that feels he very was good. disconcerting to me. <laughs> it was fun. Well, well we, we were just skating with him on a different ramp, but... Um, he it was fun skating with him. He he did not want you to go ahead of him though. He was very upset if you got <laughs> if you went faster than him. <laughs> well, why didn't the monkey fall on the loop ramp? <laughs> oh, we didn't put him on the loop ramp. Oh, you should have. No, no, no. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so um, I was listening to the Making Oprah podcast, and I will tie this together. But one of her pro producers said that people will come up to the producer and say, "Look, I want to be the next Oprah. What do I have to do?" And the producer is constantly telling people, look, there'll, there'll never be another Oprah. The time and the circumstance and the person are such that there'll only be one Oprah. And you, Tony Hawk, are one in a million. I mean, there's not going to be another Tony Hawk. No one's going to come up and just say, I want to be Tony, and there they are. But how much of you in your success do you attribute to grit and hustle and hard work? And how much is luck? How much is timing? And how much is, just, I don't know, insanity? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I, I would hope that I could credit it to more perseverance and determination because I was doing all this stuff to no accolades for a long time. Uh, you know, I was learning all these tricks and, 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 and really risking myself and, and my, my body for the sake of progression to very little, um, recognition. So, and and I think that the luck of the timing was that it, that I never quit. So when when skating was was semi big in the '80s, you know I was riding high on this wave of success that I thought was never going to end. And as it crashed down in the early '90s, I never quit skating. I kept trying to learn these tricks because I enjoyed it too much. I wasn't thinking that oh this is going to come back around. And I'm going to be riding high again. But then as as it came back around, the probably the luck of the timing was that. I got involved in doing a video game. Uh, in um, we started working on 1997, and then in 1999, when 
skating was huge on TV, X Games, and that's when I, I made my 900. Our video game was released that same year. I mean, that was the perfect storm of PR for the most part mm -hmm. um, and promotion for the game. And that was my sort of exit from competing. So in that sense, I was very lucky, but I feel like I was working on this all along and had those opportunities come earlier, I would have grabbed them. Yeah. So one more question. Um, this podcast is called The Same 24 Hours, which means we all have the same 24 hours in our day, but it's what we do in those 24 hours that leads to our greatest health, happiness, and success. So what is something that you do on a daily basis that you think gives you that greatest health and happiness and success? Uh, I, I would have to say staying grounded in in that waking up early with our kids, getting them off to school, and being having that sense of normalcy in in a in a life that is fantastical and crazy at times. Um, that is what gives me probably the most pride, and and I feel like I'm connecting with our kids in a way that is important and not just leaving it to nannies or whatever you know whatever it is yeah. that people expect of me um we're very much ground you know taking out the trash doing that kind of stuff like we're grounded in reality and that keeps us very connected um and then the other stuff sure i love to go skate and and that that's probably what gives me the most sense of peace and and um and value in terms of my career um but it's definitely doing the normal stuff with our kids that i i, I could never um, uh, I could never underestimate. Well, Tony, I will let you go. Thank you so much for your time. My husband's going to geek out completely, but you snooze, you lose, man. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> well, have a good one. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. For those of you who are enjoying the podcast, I would be eternally grateful if you would subscribe and rate the podcast on iTunes. Episode 88 is this one, and this is the first time I believe I've asked. So if you're still along for the ride, I would really appreciate a subscription and a rating. It does help me out. So thanks a lot, you guys.